started it again on the YouTube because there's people with coronavirus on here, so they can join in in the future. All right. So a word about words. Remember Olinsky's talking about, right, like how to have a revolution, right, how to go about the procedural methods of having an ideological revolution where you can have a new system of government or new changes to the current system of government actually take place, right? This is like a real world manual, right? It's not like Marx, like the pie in the sky, kind of like people distribution of wealth and utopia. It's like a real world manual for like, it's like, you can watch like a Harley commercial, right? Like, man, I'd love a Harley. It'd be so cool to have a Harley. That'd be awesome, right? But then it's like, Okay, I have that idea. I can go buy a Harley, right? I can hope for winning the lottery to buy a Harley. Or, like, I could slowly order the pieces for a Harley off of eBay and somehow learn to put them together so it makes a Harley, but it's, like, cheaper and more gradual, right? And so this is kind of like that. This is the piecing together of the elements of a revolution in a pragmatic fashion that's real world and allows you to kind of build it over time, right? That's the, the outline of the book or the purpose of this, right? All right. Let me zoom in here so we can have some readers. All right. The passions of mankind have boiled over into all areas of political life, including its vocabulary. The words most common in politics have a most yeah, the words most common in politics have become stained with human hurts, hopes, and frustrations. All of them are loaded with popular opprobrium, which means like you know, the people just don't like like a cliche, a cliche term, right? Or like a like catch it with a dollar sign that people are just like, oh, it's not a real word, it has a dollar sign in it, right? Like, that's like an opprobrium, right? Some people are like, I just don't like it because it's popular now, right? Um, or it's overused. And their use results in a conditioned negative emotional response. Even the word politics itself, which Webster says is the science and art of government, is generally viewed in a context of corruption. Ironically, the dictionary synonyms are discreet, provident, diplomatic, and wise. The same discolorations attached to other words prevalent in the language of politics, words like power, self-interest, compromise, and conflict. They become twisted and warped, viewed as evil. Nowhere in the prevailing political literacy, or illiteracy rather, more clearly revealed than in those typical interpretations of words. This is why we pause here for a word about words. The question may be legitimately raised, why not use other words? Words that mean the same but are peaceful do not result in such negative emotional reactions. There are a number of foundational reasons for rejecting such substitution. Like when we're talking about like, politics or talking about how to go ahead and have the revolution or political things at all right like why not find like pejorative nice soft terms to talk about um power and so like um uh, what's a nice what's a nice way to say power that doesn't sound well like ooh, we don't like power and powerful people like strong okay it's a little less maybe like those currently in charge for the present moment or those currently in charge of the community for the present moment in time Maybe, or the powerful. Um, uh, let's, we'll find. We'll start thinking some more synonyms later. Um, all right, there are no, okay. No, no, no. First, by using combinations of words such as harnessing the energy instead of the single word power. Oh, here we go. We begin to dilute the meaning, and as we use purifying synonyms, we dissolve the bitterness, the anguish, the hate, and love, the agony and triumph attached to these words, leaving an aseptic imitation of life. In the politics of life, we are concerned with what what the Okay, sorry, I thought we were like missing a lead there. We we're concerned with the slaves and the Caesars, not the Vestal Virgins. I thought I was saying trying to say halves again. I was like, how is that? Okay. Slaves and the Caesars, not the Vestal Virgins. It is not is not just that in communication as in thought, we must every strive for simplicity. The masterpieces of philosophic or th scientific statement are frequently no longer than a few words. For example, equals MC squared. It is more than that, it is a determination not to detour around reality. To use any other word but power to change the meaning of everything we're talking. So if we like start using like slipping out other terms and not saying things directly, right? Um, about the conditions of life, about the politics that influence life, right? You have, like he says, these emotional connotations that come up with words after a while, right? And so people are like, oh, talk, we don't want to talk politics. Like, don't talk politics. Don't talk about you know the haves and the have-nots, the powerful and disenfranchised. That makes us feel sad because like we have to recognize there's like evil in the world, man. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to watch, I don't know, whatever's what's the show everybody's watching nowadays on Netflix? It was that Tiger King thing for a minute, wasn't it? I mean, I guess everyone was talking about that. I've never seen that thing, but I guess everybody's over that now. Um, so what are y'all watching on Netflix now? Chappelle, well, it's a classic. Yeah, so people would be like, I just want to watch my Chappelle show without you talking about politics. Actually, actually, it's more difficult, too. But, like, without talking about politics, without talking about, you know, these, these terms in the world that make us think of differentiations between, like, you know, good in the world and evil in the world. We want to have things boiled down and like dissolved to be these nice little neutral masses like 
you have like a custodial engineer instead of a janitor, right? It's pejorative terms, right? Like if you're having like a, a you're getting your butt kicked in a battle and you retreat, right? It's a tactical withdrawal, not a retreat, right? You find these nice ways that they say things don't actually have the power they used to have. And he's saying this is a bad idea. When we're talking about changing uh, language in politics, right? Mark Twain once put it, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. See what he did there? Okay. Um, Power is the right word, just as self-interested, compromised, and other simple political words are. For they were conceived in and have to become part of politics from the beginning of time. To pander to those who have no stomach for straight language and insist upon bland, non-controversial stances is a waste of time. <clears throat> they cannot or deliberately will not understand what we are dis discussing here. I agree with Nietzsche's point. Probably people have heard of Nietzsche, maybe. German philosopher said God is dead once. He didn't mean God is actually dead. Like, we can talk about that, maybe. But, um... What he's like, he's like, he's like, God is dead and man has killed him. He's like, long live the dead God. Like, ha, ha, ha. Like, what he's talking about is not actually like, he's not anti-Christian or anti-God like, or anything. He's not even joking about it. He's saying that, like, because of scientific innovations in the 18, late 1800s, right, like, people don't have to believe in God anymore because they have a scientific explanation for everything. So through our rationalizations and our discovery of evolution and all these other explanations that are out there, right, like, people don't have to believe in God as an answer to questions. And he's like, that's a danger to things because like science like rewrites itself like every five years. Um, like there's always a new species of discovery that we thought was extinct or this new planet or Pluto's not a planet now. Or like the ways we think about the origins of the universe or how quantum physics works or the dark matter exists, right? Is like changes readily like every four or five years. And so Nietzsche's like, we can't put like a religious faith in science because at least the thing about God is like, nobody's ever met him. So he kind of stays the same as like, an unknown quantity, but science claims to know quantities about the world, right? And then gets proven wrong. And so when people start believing that science is a God or replace God with science, right? The God is dead thing. Nietzsche's like, we're going to be in trouble and we're going to have a lot of like totalitarian governments who try to leverage their science and their power on people. And that's what happened in Germany not that long after that, <laughs> right? So like when you people say, oh yeah, Nietzsche, God is dead. What a jackass. It's like, well, yeah, he did say that, but it's not what he meant. <laughs> like, I mean, it's what he meant. He wasn't like, yay, we killed God. Thank, thank God. All right, um, okay, so why stroke the hypersensitive, the hypersensitive ears of our modern weaklings? Why even yield a single step to the tartuffery of words? Tartuffery of words. Tartuffe was a play of this French guy who would like do these crazy, like, like he'd go around most basically like lie to everybody, but like not quite. Like he was really good at like telling lies about mission. And so he had like seven wives and he married at different times. He was a sailor and like went around and like, we're like, oh yeah, I'll marry you, whatever. And somehow got around like the legal framework of having seven wives because he like wouldn't actually say I do, but like kind of would. And so it was a play, it was a comedy play. About that. Anyways, uh, for us psychologists would involve a tartuffery of action. For a psychologist today shows his good taste, others may say his integrity in this, if anything, that he resists the shamefully moralized manner of speaking, which makes all modern judgments about men and things slimy. Like, you can't say something's good or bad, is what he's saying. Like, psychologist is like, oh, well, like, maybe you killed that puppy. But, like, maybe you had a rough day, or maybe, like, your mother didn't hug you enough. And so it's like, you know, you didn't kill the puppy. You reprised it in an enactment of rage from the lack of hugs you were given when you were three um, by your mother. And the guy's like, oh, okay, I don't feel so bad about killing that puppy now. Psychologist like, yeah, that's why you're paying this much money, right? So that's what he's saying. Like, psychologists like have a way of like getting away from what actually happened and into reasons and cause for. I'm not talking crap on psychology. Like, at least at some points in time, that's what they tend to do, right? Uh, and so he's saying we can't have that in politics because otherwise everything will be justified and there'll be no actual right or wrong. We have to care about right and wrong. When we're talking about politics because they affect like the way we live life. Speaking of which, who's voted today? Is anybody gonna vote? You don't have to vote today. Are people voting. Y'all should vote. Even if you vote for Spider-Man, y'all should vote. Like, vote down, though. <laughs> Don't vote Spider-Man for every office, though. <laughs> All right. Okay. Somebody want to read this paragraph? Will somebody read this paragraph? I'm going to do the Bible thing. I'm like, turn a page. I'm like, you. Oh, sorry. Did you read that? Uh, the top. Did we approach a critical point just through job?
Say what? Tongue. Uh-huh. A program. He uses big words, John. Yeah. So, let me take over. You're going to find them, huh? Yeah? All right. All right. It's hard to the mask, too. Like, I would, like, show my own tongue on yours. <laughs> All right. Um, Cleanse the appropriate with the word power. But the new words mean something different. So that they've tranquilized us. They begin to shepherd our mental processes off the main conflict ridden grimy, and realistic power cake I'll be the light of life. To travel down the sweet smelling, peaceful, more socially acceptable, more respectable, indefinite byways ends in a failure to achieve an honest understanding of the issues that we must come to grips with if we are to do the job. What is it? Why can't we use this line? Not a purple last line. Why we slide? If we can, why shouldn't we? Uh, no, definitely, because then this is just what these things risk, right? They risk offending people, right? Um, or make people uncomfortable, which is kind of the same thing. Right. No, no, there's, 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 a, there's a censorship of thought that happens, right? When you're not using the words that actually mean the things you want them to mean, right? If you're using different, like if I have, um, I don't know, a, a border collie puppy, right? And I can't use the word border collie, so I'm like, oh, it's a boxer puppy, because boxer's okay, so still, right? Like, I'm talking about my puppy, but it's not the same thing, right? Or if it's a puppy, I have to call it a cat, it's not like puppies anymore, right? Oh, I'm back on today. But like, then it's not the same thing, right? Or if it's like a pure breed German Shepherd, and I'm like, oh, it's a mixed German Shepherd because like I can't say pure breed anymore or whatever, right? Like, it's not the same thing. And then what he's saying here is the actual. So the problem with it is that this doesn't actually protect people from the uncomfortability of language, right? Because what this does is this uncomfortability of language. Right? It alerts us as human beings to when there is a problem in society or a problem morally that needs to be addressed, right? And so it's uncomfortable to say shocking things or bold things, right? And it might offend some people, but like if those words aren't spoken, right, then the people who are being hurt by those power systems, right, those who don't have power or whatever, right, or those who are um, oppressed by those words or by those systems the words represent, right, won't get addressed. Like those little grievances, there can never be a chance to like actually have a change to solve those problems because we're not actually talking about the problem. We're talking about a diluted down, not that bad version of the problem. And remember what he said about the Declaration of Independence, right? It was like an all or nothing thing. Like, people say, oh, Britain was giving us food and money and stuff, and they protect us, and you have know, soldiers sometimes. So, like, we don't like them that much, but it's like 60 40, right? Nobody had fought the damn war. Right? The same thing with political change. If you want people to ballot box, organizing, marching, trying to make an actual change, right? You can't say, well, the government's like sort of kind of not the most honest thing in the world. Right? No, they're effing corrupt and liars, right? And like, if you don't say those words that are uncomfortable and bold, right, then nobody's going to be motivated enough to actually try to change the thing. It's not that bad. Because you didn't say it was that bad. You don't want to say bad words. All right? Is that making sense? I mean, it sucks, but it makes sense. So I think that's something that's happened, though, right? Because of the deep desire, I think, in, in my generation and y'all's generation. To like not offend people, right? Like we want everybody to get along and be happy, generally speaking, I think. Um, and we're sensitive in general to like other people's feelings and stuff. And so we don't say stuff like just to hurt people, but we also is like, like generally speaking, we don't, but we also are very conscious of things we say that unintentionally hurt people. 
And so it self censor a lot of stuff. I think it does like the limit a lot of the boldness of language or the certainty of language at times. And the thing about that that sucks too is where, okay, so if I'm not, if I'm saying things I'm trying to perceive where you're at, and not say anything that, you know, makes you uncomfortable or offend you or whatever, right? But I'm not actually saying what I think then, then nobody really knows where any of us actually stands on anything either, right? So like everybody's kind of this like faceless gray shape and like maybe someday behind closed doors after like four beers, you'll say that, you know, you actually want to blow the government up or whatever it is, right? That you like you don't say out loud because people might not think it's okay. So we also don't know how similar our thoughts are to other people. We have a distance in our relationship with other humans because like I'm saying, you know, whatever the words are that's supposed to make it so I'm not offending anybody and so are you. And so like I can't trust you because I can't trust myself because we're both saying it's like programmed scripts and not actually what we think. And so, yeah, it's kind of sad. I mean, it's good that people aren't offended, I guess, but it's also like, I'd rather like offend you and be like, oh man, I'm so sorry. Like, I didn't mean to, I didn't know I hurt you. Like I can, I won't do that again, whatever. Instead of just like, hi, nice to meet you, whatever. And like never saying anything, like just like, how's the weather? It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Spurs didn't win the NBA championship. No, nope, no. Nope. Okay. Bye. Like how, how undeep is that? How shallow is that? Right. All right. So let's look at the word power and then we'll talk about energies. Power meaning ability, whether physical, mental, or moral to act, has become an evil word with the overtones and undertones that suggest the sinister, the unhealthy, the Machiavellian. That guy wrote The Prince about like how to quash and crush like peasants and maintain your royal position in Italy. Um, he's a jackass, but interesting book. I suggest a phantasmagoria, which is like, I'm just going to like do the, to find his words for you. Phantasmagoria is like this unholy miasma of like souls. Like you ever seen like, or read Dante's Inferno or seen like, uh, Disney's Fantasia where they have the Night on Ball Mountain the Vivaldi piece where it's like the devil and all these things like the miasma like all these floating souls around and like torment and chaos and like that's the phantasmagoria a open it's like it's from Agora like the open space in, in Greek right and then phantasm like a spirit it's like a bunch of spirits floating around phantasmagoria um, of the nether regions the moment the word power is mentioned it is as though hell had been opened exuding the stench of the devil's cesspool of corruption it evokes images of cruelty, dishonesty, selfishness, arrogance, dictatorship, and abject suffering. The word power is associated with conflict. It is unacceptable in our present Madison Avenue deodorized hygiene, where controversy is blasphemous and the value is being liked and not offending others. Power in our minds has become almost synonymous with corruption and immorality. Whenever the word power is mentioned, somebody sooner or later will refer to the classical statement of Lord Acton and cite follows. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. In fact, the correct quotation is, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We can't even read Acton's statement accurately. Our minds are so confused by our own conditioning. <laughs> All right. So I think this is interesting to think about. This is 63, 60, between 63, he wrote the book and was published in 68. This is before Twitter models. This is before Facebook, before MySpace. Like, and it's still the same kind of like, being like this, what is important, right? Not being right or actually trying to change anything, right? Not having a real stance or being an authentic individual, but just being, you know, smiling by the rice you're eating on Facebook or whatever, and like everybody likes your picture. All right. So we're going to finish this section here. The corruption of power is not in power, but in ourselves. And yet, what is this power which men live by and to a significant degree live for? Power is the very essence, the dynamo of life, it is the power of the heart pumping blood and sustaining life in the body. It's the power of an active citizen, participation pulsing upward providing a unified strength for a common purpose. Power is an essential life force, always in operation, either changing the world or opposing change. Power or organized energy may be a man-killing explosive or a life-saving drug. The power of a gun may be used to enforce slavery or to achieve freedom. The power of the human brain can create man's most glorious achievements and develop perspectives and insights into the nature of life-opening horizons previously beyond imagination. The power of the human mind can also devise philosophies and ways of life that are the most destructive for the future of mankind. Either way, power is a dynamo of life. What do we think about this? Are we agreeing more or less? Or is he just kind of like rattling about nonsense? We don't really care what he says anymore. Like, what's the importance of like reclaiming the word power? I guess I, mean, if he, I think he's trying to reclaim the word power, or at least say like, do not talk about power or not use the word power. But like, it's involved in everything, right? If power is like the willingness and the ability and the chance to act on something or an action, right? Then like, 
the fact that you got your butt out of bed this morning and came to class, right, is an act of power, personal power, generation. Right? Probably more than I even know. Following track, I'm saying, more or less. All right. Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist. Does someone want to read the Hamilton bit? There's a musical about Hamilton. Maybe someone wants to read the Hamilton paragraph. Thank you. You can sing it if you want. You can rap battle it like in Hamilton. Nations. <laughs> yeah, stick to. Cool, thank you. So, people familiar with these folks, the Hamilton, right? Found your father, found the New York Post, had a musical written about him, $10 bill guy. Um, Ignatius is the guy who found the Jesu it's Jesuits, their Catholic order of like, like, they're almost like the soldiers of Christ. They're like, we're going to go out and like convert the world, guys. Let's all go. And like, they're, they're funny guys. Because um, now, like, so Jesuits nowadays are like the most atheist, like Catholics in the world. <laughs> Went to this like Gerard Lee Hopkins conference, who's a poet, um, who writes these beautiful poems in like the 1900s. And like, there's like, half college professors and half Jesuit priests. The Jesuits are all like drinking wine and like talking, like saying foul words and stuff and cussing and like, are like, don't believe in God. And all the like, professors are like, we kind of don't do those things. It's hilarious. Good guys, the, the Jesuits. Uh, Pascal was a philosopher and a natural scientist. Blaise Pascal. Cool name. All right, just in case you wanted to be a cool name. All right. It's impossible to conceive of a world devoid of power. The only choice of concepts is between organized and unorganized power. Man has progressed only through learning how to develop and organize instruments of power in order to achieve order, security, morality, and civilized life itself, instead of a sheer struggle for physical survival. Every organization known to man from government down has had only one reason for being. That is the organization for power in order to put into practice or promote its common purpose. So if you look at, like, um, the United States military, right? Like, it's the organization of power, both in the, like, the power of having the funding to do it, the power like your orders and have the ability to go wage war right and the, the power of like you know military superiority with the like, planes and trains and automobiles and tanks and stuff, right? Those are all engines of power, right? And the military is an organization for the deployment and use of that power, right? So you think of like, I don't know, like if uh, power is like all the lightning that's ever in the atmosphere, right? And like Zeus is the person wielding, right? That the lightning bolt that he throws down is like the organization of that power, right? Like power is up there, right? And it's the job of political organizations or governments, or whatever, to find a way to channel that power into manifestation in the real world that helps people, right? Or does it well to help or hurt to accomplish whatever their end is, right? Like obviously, like the SS and the Gestapo, like we're not out to like make, make world peace or like help the common good, right? Generally speaking, um, but like the organizations we're talking about, especially in American government, generally designed at least with the premise of trying to help the general welfare, right? And help people do better and to help um, human flourishing to some degree, right? Um, so, yeah. So, if we look at like, I mean, all the governmental institutions, the EPA, like the Environmental Protection Agency, right? They're trying to deal with carbon emissions and like deal with oil rights and drilling, right? Protect grasslands and start California wildfires and stuff, right? Like, they are an organization with the directive of protecting the environment, right? Same thing with like um, the State Department. Diplomacy, right? That all these things have a specific task and function for a specific use of power in the field in which they operate, right? So he's like, we can't just say, let's not talk about power because like, every little thing in the world that runs, especially on a political basis, is dealing with the administration of and furthering of power to some specific goal. All right. So we're going to go through this paragraph when we're done with this. So let's do that. When we talk about a person's lifting himself up by his own bootstraps, we're talking about power. Power must be understood for what it is, for the part it plays in our everyday 
Yeah, in every area of our life. If we are to understand it and thereby grasp the essentials of relationships and functions between groups and organizations, particularly in a pluralistic society, to know power and not fear it is essential to its constructive use and control. In short, life without power is death. A world without power would be a ghostly wasteland, a dead planet. And there would be no cell phone dude about that. All right. So we're going to try to look at the evidence sheets again and talk about the so the biggest thing about them, right? Let me find them again. That people are shorting themselves on a little bit or not, they're making they gonna make their paper writing a little more difficult is the is in the data. Um, so in the data, right, you want to have direct quotations from your source, right? Hopefully everybody's doing that. You're going to quote from the article or the book or whatever it is you're citing from, right? Now, I don't want just like, I mean, I want, you can do whatever you want, but it would behoove you not to have just little one-sentence quotes there, right? Or just pulling just statistics from it into the bullet point list, right? Because these are going to be direct quotes going into your paper. You want context, right? Like you're talking about... Um, well, um, right? And you have a statistic that says, like, the average income of or out of the average money spent on a student in an impoverished school district is eight thousand eleven hundred dollars a year, and in a wealthy school district, it's fifteen thousand seven hundred dollars a year. End quote. Like, it's cool as a statistic, right? But like, a school district where, like, what's high income? What's low income? Like, are we talking about like? You know, Orange County, California, and like the Appalachians. Like, we're talking about like two counties next to each other, two um, school districts next to each other, right? Like, we need to have some kind of a framework to tell what that statistic means, right? And I'm sure in the article it came from, I would hope, right? There was context around that that explained what the numbers mean and what they relate to, it, right? And so, always when you find the juicy little nugget you want to use for your paper, right? Look a couple sentences before and after it. And oftentimes, I would urge you to include that in the quotation you're going to use for your evidence sheet. Because, like I said before, the goal is when we have our evidence sheets all done, we should be able to put all the research and articles and Googling everything away and just have our evidence sheets in front of us, right? And from those, be able to write and piece together the final paper, the, the outline, which would be the final paper, right? And so if you just have single statistics or like, you know, half a sentence quotation, it's going to make it a lot harder to like put that in the paper body and have it flow. You have to do a lot more writing on the back end as opposed to on the front end. Um, let me, I think this will be somewhat more clear when I show you the outline format. Um, I'll reveal it to y'all too today, so I'll post it in this section too and you can look at it. Okay. So you'll notice that there's highlighting, that's cool. But the highlighting parts are like the instructions for where you're getting the evidence or where you're getting the, the text that's going here, right? So let's, let's look at the beginning, right? So you start with the introduction, right? I would recommend don't start with the introduction. We'll do that in class. Um, we'll, we'll massage that a little bit. But start down here when it says justification for existing harms, right? You cut and paste your answers from the plan worksheet, sub points one and two right here, right? Sub points one, one and two. Remember the plan worksheet was like, what's the policy of like head changes, right? It was the first question. That was one and two were, does it have substantial harm? Does it have harms? All those harms are substantial, right? So that would be step point one and two. So you go back to your plan sheet, cut and paste your answer to what the harms are, and then are they substantial and worth solving, right? Right here for the justification of the harms. There's even a little sentence you can put it in, like the problem that faces, um, I don't know, whatever. So the problem that faces victims of sex trafficking today, right, is a lack of support and training for a lack of support for victims and their families and the lack of training for officers to identify potential trafficking or potential traffickers as well as victims in need of help. Right. Hypothetically, you just kind of plug those, you know, your, what your plans about in those two blanks there. And then you're good for that part. Right. Um, and then you can cut and paste the points from that plan worksheet right there. And then, so then you go to your major claim proposition. So you should be able to cut and paste your answer to the two part of the worksheet, which is like, What's your plan, right? Like the U.S. United States federal government should whatever, right? That's the blank to fill in here. Um, so establish a policy to insult child sex trafficking and provide support for victims or to 
make term limits a thing. Whatever your policy is, right, you cut and paste that right here. And so what we're doing here is we're building the introduction to your paper, right? You start off with an attention getter like Merriam's Webster's Dictionary to find sex trafficking. And don't, don't do that. Don't use the dictionary. That's a whole way to go. Like, Merriam's Webster's Dictionary is defined as hero since the beginning of time as someone who does good things and stuff. Never, never call the dictionary. Because <laughs> first, I have gotten so many papers like since the beginning of time, Webster's Dictionary is something like, first of all, Webster's Dictionary was invented in like 1930. That's not the beginning of time. <laughs> like, all the cavemen walking around like reading Webster's Dictionary, like, oh, what's club mean? I don't think so. Right? Um, so, yeah, a good uh, hook or a quotation or a fictional narrative, right? Like, you're like, oh, man, meet little Timmy. Little Timmy's locked in school today. And the cops decided to stop and frisk little Timmy. And little Timmy had a dime bag in his pocket. And so now little Timmy is going to jail for 40 years for conspiracy charges to sell marijuana to his class or to whatever, to have marijuana in class classmates. Why? Because now, like, that shouldn't happen. Why? Because marijuana should be legal. In, in intro to marijuana, <laughs> right? You make up a story, right? Um, I mean, you use a quotation to begin it. Like, people don't like Winston Churchill once said, "Like aim high and shoot to kill" or something, right? Okay, that's a good quotation. Like, if you're giving a quotation, it should be somewhat actually like, related to your paper, not like aim high and shoot to kill. So we're gonna kill the problems with illegal marijuana in the United States of America, right? Like, I've seen a lot of people try to just. That's not how you use a quote to start a paper, right? If you have, like, you're talking about, like, poverty or ending homelessness, right? You're like, Mother Teresa of Calcutta once said, like, you know, the homeless and the po impoverished are the most beautiful people in the world because their souls are vibrant even though their living conditions aren't, you know, as opulent as, like, mansions, right? Like, I think I agree with Mother Teresa. That, like, the people who are, like, you know, maybe impoverished or destitute, right, have a beautiful interior life that should be, you know, cultured and, and, and cultivated and brought back into communion with the rest of society so that they can have a more holistic and vibrant, you know, national culture in, in India when she was working, right? Like, that would be a good quotation. maybe. I made it up, though. She didn't actually say that. That's kind of what she was doing. Um, right? Uh, yeah. But don't just, like, you know, The Rock once said, whatever. Let's talk about penguin trafficking. A, po a penguin poaching or something, right? Okay. So, review of supporting claims. So, what we have right now, we have the, the intro, right? We have, here's what's so bad right now. It's kind of the transition between the intro and, like, what the paper's going to talk about. The next thing is the plan, right? The policy proposal, which would be, like, a thesis, essentially, right? So, here's the thing I'm arguing for, right? In the review of supporting claims, which would be the first, the answer to number two on each of your policy proposal evidence sheets, which would be supporting claim. In your own words, the claim you're making, the evidence supports, right? So you literally cut and paste all those in a row with commas between them or maybe periods of the longer statements, right? You have what you call your essay map in high school, right? You have the preview of all the six topics you're going to talk about in the upcoming paper. Boom, drop the mic, intro's over. Body of the paper. My first, my first supporting claim. So you can say, you can use these kind of like stock phrases. You can use it, people use in policy stuff a lot. My first contention is, you don't have to say it's a contention. You're not going to say like, I think that freaking one reason I think marijuana should be legal, one reason or one thing that would help child sex trafficking, or like one reason the problem with child sex trafficking is so prevalent is, or like, can you lead with either like why your solution is so good or why the harms are so bad? Either way, right? You're going to talk about both in the paper, like why your stuff sucks so bad now and why your plan is going to fix it. You can do one of two options. You can either go with here's how everything's going to be so great and here's how it fixed everything that's so terrible, or you can go shit's real bad and here's where we fix it. I mean, either way, usually it goes, here's why shit's bad, and here's why we're going to fish. <laughs> so it makes more logical sense. But I'm not going to say you have to, like, do it in any set order. Um, and also when I say, like, use evidence sheet one or whatever, it doesn't have to be evidence sheet, like, the first one you filled out, right? Use an evidence sheet. You can reorder them however you want for your uh, for the, your paper, right? Like, you have ones that relate more closely together, but they're the first and sixth evidence sheet. Like, put them together, like, as the first and second evidence sheet, Right? That makes sense. What I'm saying, like, when I say, like, use points two and three or questions two and three on your evidence sheet, it doesn't mean like you have to do them in the order you turn them in, right? You can use whatever piece of evidence whenever you want to, right? But this is the structure for them. All right. So first piece of supporting evidence is question two and three on your evidence sheet, and then you have to think about this too when you're doing it, right? Um. So say what you have to say. Say why the person should care about it, right? And then explain. So you can even say like, like, a quote according to Mister. Uh, I think I made this up. Yeah. 
if it's a quote, say like according to Mrs. Love, an English teacher at Barrington High School, like Miss Love, an English teacher at Barrington High School, once said, everyone needs to be quotes on what we So that's why we have literacy programs for sure, right? So if you're gonna introduce a quotation, which is like your your data point, right? Your question um three on your evidence sheet. Pull back up here. That are the examples, right? And you're quoting from somebody or a government agency or whatever, right? You can enter you should Try to introduce the quote, and when we get doing the paper, we'll have the worksheet I'll give out in class about how to do quotations in the middle of the sentence, how to do them at the beginning, how to do them at the end, right? Um, it can be helpful. So, like, she would say, uh, according to Miss Love, English teacher back in high school, reading kids suck at reading nowadays. We need to fix that, in quote, right? Or, according to the NSA in a report released in 12, 2014, like, right, white nationalism is, like, the primary source of domestic terrorism in the United States of America, Right? Or you could also say at the end, you'd be like, you say like, nobody here knows how to read anymore, said Miss Barrington, an English teacher at Bloodington High School, right? So you can place it however you want. There's just suggestions, right? Um, oh, yeah. When you speak quotation marks, you say quote, end quote. Um, so you don't, they aren't, uh, they aren't quotations. This is something that people get angry about. I don't really care, but I know, put a note here, so I'll read it to you. We say, I quote somebody, right? It's not, quote like, the, these aren't quotes. Like the little markies are quotation marks. They're not quotes. There's a thing people care about. I don't know why I even have them there. I think it was Miss Snarky one day. Um, all right. If you're using an example, explain the source of the example, right? If so, if you're using like a narrative example, right? Um, but you can use the evidence, like I said, like somebody's account, like a person who was child, child sex trafficked or whatever, and was a victim and could use resources or had resources that worked, right? And they have a narrative story. Like the evidence doesn't just have to be statistics, right? Evidence can be a first-hand narrative of somebody who was involved in the problem, right? Or was involved in the scenario that you're trying to solve. It can't all be like just net, like a, you know, diary or whatever in the policy paper, but like you can mix between anecdotal evidence and statistical evidence, right? So, or if it's something you've experienced yourself, right? If like you, not child sex trafficking, hopefully, but like, if you like got arrested for marijuana for this, you want to live like marijuana, but man, here's why it was so crappy for me. I experienced the system, man, that sucked. And then, after that, I get statistics, like in your next evidence sheets, right? But, yeah. Um, so if you're using multiple pieces of data from one claim, so you have like a couple of evidence points, right? They're back in the same claim. You have a couple of quotes about the same um, general piece of evidence. Make sure you transition between them and differentiate between them, right? Like don't just go quotation, in quotation, begin second quotation, right? Like be like, and then and in addition to the data, like in addition to the, like 45% of prisoners in the United States are nonviolent drug offenders. It's also found that, of, t of those, 20% were first-time offenders, right? They don't just go, don't just run the whole thing together in one big chunk, right? Um, so then you would copy question four on your evidence sheet, right? Which is the, and that, or the warrant, right? Which is explaining why your freaking claim is proved by your data, right? So then you, so the way this looks on the page when you actually copy and paste it, right, is you have the intro to your claim, right? You're saying, okay, the marijuana is, marijuana legalization is necessary because of the problems it has in the prison system and for people who are nonviolent offenders and first-time offenders being targeted for too long, you have statistics about that, right? And then you can go on to say in your warrant, which you already said in your evidence sheet, right, that because of the mere nature of nonviolent drug offenders and, like, freaking um, mandatory minimum sentences, right, that the problem can only be solved by making, it le by making marijuana legal because there's no, like um, – like these people are in prison because of mandatory minimum sentences and nonviolent offenses, right? There's no real way to look at solving the problem other than to stop them being put in prison in the first place or stop smoking weed. That's probably not going to happen at this point. Um, and if you're for legalizing weed, probably don't think that making weed legal is a problem, right? So that's, that's your copy and paste question four from your evidence sheet, right? And then you move down to your second piece of supporting evidence. So your next evidence sheet, right? Next evidence sheet, questions two and three, right? Why is, what are you saying? Why should I care? Explain it. And then the warrant. And then, boom, next down. So you just then re rinse and repeat that for all six of your evidence sheets, like new paragraph every time, right? Or probably, a I mean, every time you answer a question, right, like each of these numbers should be probably a new paragraph, right? If you have a lot, if you have longer quotations, right, you can have multiple paragraphs within this um, first piece of evidence. It depends on how long your quotations are running, right? But basically a good way to at least start breaking down the paper so it's an organized unit of thought is just do number one, cut and paste it here. You can leave the bold heading there for now, right? Go to number two, paste it in. So you'll have all these tag things like the bolded parts and then your text you've copied and pasted that, right? It'll look like a paper quite. 
but it's going to have all the data there and all the, the writing there. And then we're going to go in and like eliminate those headings and make transitions between the thoughts, right? Um, and so on. So we just kind of rinse and repeat that all the way down to here, which is the proposed solution. So you copy and paste this. So after you talk about all the problems, right? And then we're going to the parts where we're going to solve it. Copy and paste me a plan worksheet, right? Which is like the detailed plan. It's the back of the detailed plan part, right? We explain how you're going to solve the problem and then how it's going to work. And the conclusion is just, you know, reviewing the supporting claims, go back up to what you had at the beginning, um, which was your assay map, your, your six supporting claims from your evidence sheets, right? And then cut and paste those in here too, and then review them as like, okay, we looked at this, 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 and this, right? And here's how the policy is going to solve the specific issues, right? And then there you go. And then you can, like, the last thing you can close with, you can give, like, an emotional appeal, or, like, for the children, for, for world hunger, or for world peace and ending of hunger, right? Or whatever kind of appeal you want to make. Well, I did not any illegalized weed, reader. Bye. <laughs> right. But you can do this part if you want to, like, give, like, a, a passion, like, rhetorical closing. Or you can just end with, like, my problem, my policy is going to solve the problem. Good enough. So, does anybody have any questions on the evidence sheets? Or finding data, or is everybody just like trucking along real good in here? We're gonna have to write it, Sam. You have to write it. Hi. <laughs> yeah. okay. Should write a policy proposal paper on Rona policies for music schools. <laughs> A little too close to the. Oh. But we all doing great. There's many, many things. If someone has, like, somehow decided how to fix whatever problem it is in seven pages, I might be open to that. You get below seven, double space, like, you can't, like, put an agenda out for a department meeting on seven pages at work. That doesn't solve a damn thing either. There's no max. I mean, I've read, I said, I've had a student who wrote, like, a 45-page one of these before. I mean, that was extra. I read it all, too. It was good. But, like, I mean, if you, if you are, if it is your life's work and burden to write this thing 50 pages long, then who am I to tell you no? But yeah, eight, yeah, eight's fine. Eight's, eight, eight to 10, seven to 10, I can say seven, eight to 10, because y'all can write seven page paper. Eight to 10 range is about, um, um, if you do the six sources, right, and put them in the outline, just with the language I even have there without writing an intro or anything, like, it's more or less going to be like seven right there. <laughs> um, so let's maybe, for anyone who's still playing along, does anybody have any, nobody has any issues finding any research? I found that hard to believe. Y'all have everything all, you just waiting to write the evidence sheets when they do. You got your articles all found, everything's golden. I believe some of you. Maybe all the people who are like not here today are the ones who have problems. <laughs> Maybe they're at home doing research right now. I doubt that. <laughs> um, I'll show you. We can talk more Solinsky. We can talk about quoting. We can talk about grammar. What do you want to talk about? I was thinking people probably had more issues than want to hands on work in the class. Today. I mean, you all just start working on the evidence sheets then or outlines or whatever. I can come around and help, or y'all can go social distance more. <laughs> or we can talk about grammar, or we can talk about whatever. Yeah. Another evidence sheet? I might have one more. I might not. If not, I can put that up there and give you a piece of line going. Yeah, I mean, I tend to carry a couple on my person at all times, but I think they've been depleted. Oh, just joking.
and maybe even before that. So, I mean, it's not going to be too new until the have to be regular by sure. But, like, if you, but I'm going to try to make sure we're through, like, the outline and, like, the how to make the outline smooth and transition and stuff, right? Before that, so I'm going to do that in class. So, I mean, my, my goal is to push through everything as if it was in class, if class was, as if they were going to be right. Um, and so, nobody's missing any instruction that you can use to help But I'm not going to make a few announcements until, like, probably the end of November, maybe December, like, back or something. You know, they may be working on the final paper until like you know the week after Thanksgiving break, and then we have one week to do portfolios after that, which is just like take assignments you've done in the class and talk about them for two days. But don't even con don't even worry about the portfolio thing at all right now. Like it's something that because the instructional period has been pushed forward, we might or might not do. I mean, I think we're gonna do it because it's really easy. It boosts everybody's grade. But if everybody in here is more or less doing fine on grades, then we might not do this. We'll see. I mean, I'm fine to do it. I'm fine to not do it. But, like, I don't want to add something on you that y'all doing at home, like, over the holidays. And that's like, oh, I got to get them to do a stupid thing. And, like, not caring about it and not getting me out of it. Because that kind of is the purpose. I mean, we can also do Zoom meetings or Teams meetings, like, after Thanksgiving. But, like, I don't know. What do we think about that? It seems like everybody's going to be, like, studying for final classes and tests and not like this. And like we get the final paper done before that, then I don't know. We'll see. We can just like hang out and talk about who got coronavirus this week or who didn't get coronavirus this week. Would it be helpful to anyone if I posted examples of previous students? Evidence sheets that have like gone to do great things with their papers. Yeah? yeah. All right. I can do that. So, and then, so I will do that. I'll post those up today. I'll post six of them up. Uh, and then I'll post one, the day that the outline we're going to do in class, which will be Thursday. We'll start doing the outline. We'll start moving stuff to the outline on Thursday, I think. Um, just to make sure we have time to get it over there and done. Before this Thanksgiving thing happens, we get through everything. Um, then I'll post a filled out outline from a student who in the past get, get, got in their paper. Do you have an example for that too? Um, would that be helpful to actually see past student work? Yeah, I can do that. I always ask students like who do like 45 page papers if I can use their work as examples. <laughs> They're always happy to do it. 